Father, thank you today. What a privilege it is, dear Lord, to be able to worship. So we come to this place, so we gather around the technology available to us, whatever it is, Father, but we've come with a hearty understanding that we've entered into your presence. And we have come for the purpose of worship. And we are here, Father, to pray and to praise and to shout from our souls that we love you, we honor you, and we praise your name. And in this moment, Lord, in the preaching of your word, hide me, dear Father, behind your shadow. Let your word, this is the desire of my heart, Father, let your word be handled accurately, carefully, clearly, and thoroughly. If that's the case, Father, then I believe, I trust, I ask, let your word fall on good ground in our hearts and accomplish those things only you can do. And I trust you to do that work in each of our lives. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there is a saying, some of you who've been around the OBA for a while, some of you who are just now in the OBA, the Open to Bible Academy, there, there is a phrase uh, that's used in the OBA. It kind of goes like this. God shapes human history by the way that people respond to God's word. Hold on to that thought. God shapes human history by the way people respond to the word of God. In Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul is drawing his readers into a flow of his sharing of the history, the Hebrew history, and God's outreach plan for humanity. He's drawing the reader in, the listener in, to hearing the Hebrew history and how God has a plan that now even includes you. He will tell us about how God took Abraham out of his father's house and a system of idolatry. How through Abraham and his progenity, Isaac and Jacob, God then promised to send to the nation that God was building through Abraham a Messiah, a Savior. Someone who could redeem the world. He does this, Paul does, by declaring Jesus as Israel's Messiah, Israel's Savior. And the historical truth is, as a nation, Israel rejected Jesus. They did that. God then moves Paul and others, and the gospel is turned towards Gentiles. And Gentiles are now offered to come into a people group the people of God that contains both Jews and Gentiles. And God is making a system of faith in Christ and calling all of humanity in it as he tells this historic story. Now in Romans 9, 10 and 11, there are theologians who call segments of this, this uh, passage here a theodicy. It's called a theodicy. It is a way to be able to explain the ways of God and that God is justified in his ways. So writers or historians or theologians who look at some of these segments of passage here in, in Romans 9 and the history of Israel and how God unfolds that history out as Paul narrates it, they would say that this theodicy is a manner and way in which people can see and perhaps begin to understand what God is doing and that he is right. Listen to me carefully. He's right 
in what he does. It's an interesting thought because he'll talk about election and those who were not elected. He's going to talk about a nation who he called to himself. And it looked like it looked like that somehow or another. We talked about it last week in verse 6. It looked like that God's word had failed because Israel as a nation rejected. But we know better. God's word never fails. It never fails. So here is something. Here is something I would ask of you early on today before we get into our passage. I want to ask you guys a question. How do you fit into God's history? How do you fit? How do we fit into God's history? What's God doing in your life? I want you to ask those questions. Ponder it and consider it. What is God doing in your life? Can you say for a fact that you know God is forming Jesus Christ in you? Is he forming Jesus Christ in you? What's God doing? Turn your Bibles into Romans 9. I'm going to read so many verses here today. And verse, I'm only going to read one verse in Romans 9. <laughs> Just one. God help me to do this and do it well. I want to look at verse 5. Romans 9 and 5 reads like this. Whose are the fathers? And from whom is the Christ according to the flesh? Who is over all, God blessed forever. The New American Standard updated version says, amen. Let me read it again. Such a long verse. Let me read it again. Whose are the fathers? And from whom is the Christ according to the flesh? Who is over all, God blessed forever Amen. It's an interesting thought. In writing about Jesus, describing the history of Israel and the history that God is unfolding in terms of his salvaric plan, Paul indicates that the fathers, these patriarchs, are from where Christ comes and he comes nationally out of Israel, but he comes literally in the flesh. And I like this about Paul. He talks about his humanity, and then he's going to talk about his divinity. And you can't afford to miss this. For when we gather to worship, this is not a ritual. This is not just an emotional experience or a social gathering. We've come to a place to honor Jesus as our Savior, our Redeemer. Paul says, I want you to see him for who he is. Listen, I want you to look back. You can take your Bibles and look back. It should be on the PowerPoint, but if you want to look back into chapter 1, I want to read what, uh, a couple of verses that Brother Dave shared with us in our responsive reading. Romans 1, verses 3 and 4. Paul writes early on in his letter to the Roman Christians, the Roman church. Verse 3, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, he says, according to the flesh. He ties in his humanity. Who was declared now, on the other hand, the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. So he combines the humanity with the deity. And he says, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord, just so you know who we're talking about. So Paul, early on in his letter, lets these Roman uh, readers or listeners, his audience here, I'm talking about Jesus, going to explain to you what the gospel is. It is the power of God. I want to tell you how he can overcome sin, how he's already done that, and it can work in your life. I can tell you Romans 4, it always happens by faith. I can tell you it's based on chapter 5, on the love of God. I can tell you that there's a symbol in the Christian faith where the baptism of Christ, him going down into the ground or his death, is a symbol of baptism where he goes down and comes back up in new life. That should have happened to you when you place your faith. And even though we have struggles in the flesh, Romans 7, thank God for Jesus. 
Because in chapter 8, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And even though chapter 9, Israel, Israel failed to put their faith in him, God never failed them. He still loves them. That ought to tell you something. No matter how bad we fail, God never fails. This is an interesting thought here. Now, I like the idea in, in verse 5, and that's why I want to take my time just a little bit. What I found in my research, I, I just had tons and tons of questions, but one of the things I found is that, you know, there, there are theologians, there are interpreters of Scripture that came, they come to chapter 9, 10, and 11, and they, they think, wow, chapter 9 is just so, so hard. And I would have to say, you know what, they're right. But I found that some interpreters find out that verse 5 is hard because the way the punctuation in the Greek texts are. And there's very little forms of punctuation. But somebody got the idea that they would put a period after the word flesh or a period after the two words or the phrase overall. And so I pressed in a little closer to ask why. And it was because some of the writers or interpreters decided that, the interpreters decided, listen, we can't, we don't want this passage to say that, that, that Jesus is God. And so I thought, well, no, I can't. Let's look this over. So I got into the ESV. I just looked at some of the other transliterations. Let me read it to you. I think I have it on the PowerPoint. The ESV uh, transliteration of the Bible reads like this. Just listen to it. It's, listen to it carefully. To them... Belong the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. Israel is tied to them. And from their race, according to the flesh, the humanity, is Christ. ESV says, who is God overall, blessed forever. The New International Version reads like this. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised, amen. And then, of course, the New American Standard updated version says, who are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. And so I'm thinking that when Paul writes and he tells this first century audience, He's indicating to them when we talk about Jesus, we are talking about not only the man, Jesus, who came in the flesh, but it is God who left heaven and became a man. I think Paul wants to make sure that's straight in the first century mind. And I have to ask myself a question. Then. How do you explain to an audience that God left heaven and came to earth? How do you explain to a first century Jewish audience that God left heaven and became a man, even if the man that he became was Jewish? Sounds reasonable. If he came as a Jewish, they wouldn't have a problem with it. But how do you explain that to people? And then somebody, somebody might ask the question, well, listen, if God left heaven, did he leave heaven unattended? Or did he put Gabriel in charge? Be with me today, Lord, as my mind just kind of wanders. You know, people have questions. People have questions. How then do you go to a, a, a nation of people, of Jewish people, and tell them that God left heaven, became a man, and we have a God-man that walked this earth? When all of Israel was taught that God is one, and there's only one God to be worshipped. So how do we see Jesus in that respect? Moses in Deuteronomy 6, 4 shared this national statement of confession with Israel. And he said, listen, listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is the Lord, is the Lord, is one, just one. Every Hebrew would have confessed that. They would have believed that. They would have trusted in that even perhaps in their history of idolatry, rebellion, and disobedience. They would have confirmed that. How do you explain this? And so my 
reading pushed me in a little bit further and I'm just asking tons of questions Ross and I'm asking these questions of God and asking them of myself and is there somewhere else in the Bible that talks about Jesus in this manner that describes both his humanity and his divinity and how do we balance that how do we see that and so you guys just walk with me as I as I share with you just just a little bit of my my planning and preparation and my research. And, and so I'm looking at the Gospel of John chapter 1, and that's easy. We can go there, and we know, we know what John says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And then John gets real bold and radical, and he says the Word was God. Doesn't play with it all. He was in the beginning with God. John just simply says the Word was God. In verse 14 of John chapter 1, his gospel, he simply says the word became flesh. His humanity. God leaves heaven and he becomes flesh. And he dwelt among us. The idea of the word dwelt is to pitch a tent. I like that idea. God believes in camping. I like it. He dwelt among us and we saw, we saw his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw him as he pitched that human tent right here on earth. In John 20, Thomas, in verse 28, Thomas kind of makes this statement. He makes this declaration. And Thomas and answered him and said to him, my Lord and my God, after Thomas sees the resurrected Christ, my Lord, my God. There are just two others. Uh, so many other things you can look at. But in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, you'll find these words. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. So you have this dialogue, God talking to God. And then in Titus, I'll conclude with these for my just references. Titus 2, there's verses 13 and 14, you, you'll find this. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This is a statement talking about the second coming of Christ, where he doesn't enter the world as a baby. He's coming back, but he's full grown. Power. Glory, arrayed in all of his glory, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The writer would say when he's coming back, this is who he is. He's our great God and our Savior. That's my Jesus. That's Israel's Christ. That's our Lord. That, that's who he is. So let's go back and look at verse 5 in chapter 9. Let's just look at, the, look at the verse. Whose are the fathers from whom the Christ according to the flesh? I'm just simply labeling this the humanity of Christ as Paul tries to explain the ways of God, and that God is right in what he's doing. He gives, he gives the promise to Abraham. He gives the promise of children and of the building of a nation. He gives the promise of land. He gives the promise of prosperity. He gives the promise of covenants, help, and hope. And you would think with all of that, they would get it right. He says that even though God did all these things, you can even pop back into verse 4, and if they, couldn't, if they didn't know any better, you might think differently, but they knew they had been adopted by God. They, they knew that they had the covenants, they had the law, they had a system of worship at the temple that God designed. They knew. They had promises, and yet they rejected him. Point in verse 5 is that God became a man. And what people could not do, God got done himself. So he came in the form of flesh. 
He emanates from the race and from the nation of Israel. He becomes a man. He enters the world, time, and history and becomes a man. And when he gets here, he experiences what you experience. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to have to, have to go to work when he works in the shop with Joseph as a carpenter or a carpenter's helper. He understands what it's like to have bread put on a table that was hewn out in the field. He understands socially, economically, physically, emotionally what it's like to be a human being. He understands what it's like to be tempted when everything that you do for the good of others, somebody questions. He knows what it's like to be deceived and talked about and rejected. The writer in Hebrews would say, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses in 415, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are. And yet when it comes to Christ, he was tempted, but he did not sin. He did not sin. Let me go back to the verse. So Paul says that the Christ is connected and tied to the history and the virginity of the nation of Israel. And he came as a man. He came in the flesh. And he says that who is over all, who is God. God bless, he says. I want to read that again in the ESV. I kind of like how the ESV put it. To them belong the patriarchs from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed and forever. One of the problems in the first century trying to explain the gospel was that somebody started a rumor, somebody started a false teaching, a heresy, and simply were going around telling people he didn't really, God didn't really become a man. He wasn't truly a real physical human being. It started that. You know, we do it a little different in the 21st century. We just flat out deny Jesus is, is God. We, people run around, well, he, you know, I don't have a problem with him being a man. Just don't let him be God. He's God, he knows too much. I don't need everybody knowing my business. You don't want to see him as God. But on the other hand, if he's not a real man, and if he's not God in flesh, he cannot pay the price for our sins. He has no power, he has no authority to do the necessary redemptive work that we got ourselves into. I'm glad Paul takes the time to help them understand that no mere man could pay our sin debt. It didn't work with the animals being sacrificed. They had to come back every year. It wasn't like they could just get it right once, George, and be through with it. Every year they came back over and over and over again. God becomes a man. And this, this, this idea of God becoming a man to pay the sin debt of humanity is the core, is the nutshell of the gospel. It's that God did for you and I what you and I could not do for ourselves. And we put our trust in Jesus Christ as not only the Messiah of Israel, but the Savior of the world who has the capacity, the power, and even the compassion to do the work that we couldn't do and pay our sin debt. He dies once for all, and he pays our debt in full. Look at something else. I just, I see this here in verse 5. He says, he is over all. He's over all. Now, th there's other passages. You can, you can look at Philippians chapter 2. I'll read it to you in a moment. But sometimes we say this thing. He's, he's got a name greater than any other name. And we just don't put any other names next to it. He's got a name greater than, than Ken. He's got a, a, a name greater than, than Carolyn. He's got a name greater than Dexter. He's got a name greater than Moses. Where do you stop? Where, where do you stop? I think Paul says when he says he is over all, he has a name above every other name in the Old Testament and the New. 
He has a name that is above every other name. As I think Paul is describing the supremacy of Jesus Christ and who he is. Help me to do this, Lord. You turn your Bibles into Philippians 2, 8. I know there's no slide on this because there's just too many verses to capture. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 read like this. Being found in the appearance as a man, Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even the death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalts him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, a name above every other name. Talking about his supremacy. And I kind of like this part, Ken, because he, he kind of closes the verse with this idea of that God is blessed. And, and I, I can see it in, in ESV and some of the other transliterations where in ESV he says that he's the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. And when we come to worship, man, I'm telling you, Praise is not a time for our performance. When we come to sing, this is not a performance presentation. This is not the place where you come to be entertained. You do that at home with surround sound. But when we come to the place of gathering where the people of God, the family of God, the redeemed of God gather, we come to worship and we come to praise God and sing those songs that praise him and bless him because he's worthy. Now, I don't come here because my voice is all that good. I'm a black preacher who can't keep key. And I'm not ashamed of it, Nakia. I'm going to sit right here, child, and I'm going to say, I don't care what key I'm in. Y'all just going to have to deal with it. Thank you. I'm going to praise him because I know who he is. I know what he's done and what it means for me. I know where he's bought me from, so I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout. I am going to tell him I love him, and I'm going I'm to do it in every, every way that I can. So I ask you, do you praise God because of who he is? I don't care what song is being sung. I'm asking you, do you praise him? Do you praise him? And you've got to get past Sunday. I'm so through, Trevor. I'm so through doing church. I don't want to do church. I want to do ministry. I don't want to do church. I want to gather with the people of God corporately, electronically, however, and I want to worship. I want to praise him. It's a big difference when you come with the motive that I know who he is, and I know what he's done. I understand the plan and the purpose. I see the history of God unfolding, and it involves me. It includes me. So I ask you again, do you really praise God? Or are you just kind of listening to the songs and going along through the order of the service? Let me ask you this, and you guys chime in in your own mind rhetorical but I want you to think about it do we praise him as we should do you come here and praise with all of your heart all your mind all your strength are you really presenting yourself before the presence of God and praising him I'm gonna answer for you the answer is no sometimes we got barriers up sometimes we're thinking about other things Sometimes his pastor, you know, it's getting late. You know, the game is about to start. You know, you're on the clock. I want y'all to know I put that clock up there. No, nobody put that clock up there. I did it. <laughs> ah, y'all just stuck here for a while. 
Be with me today, Lord. No, we don't praise. And maybe Ken, maybe Narmi, maybe, uh, you know, Miosha, maybe we won't be able to. Maybe we won't be able to till we get to heaven and fully be able to embrace that which is our, our capacity to praise God. Maybe we won't. But I'll tell you one thing, when you do get to heaven and you hear the angelic voices, when you hear the voices of those who were martyred, when you hear the voices of those that made it through abject poverty, those who came through tragedy and who stand in the presence of God and they worship him, oh, I think you have a different attitude then. When you get into the presence of God and there's no longer this weight, this heavy weight of sin, I think, I think things will change. I think things will change. Look back at verse 2 with me. Paul said, I have great sorrow, great grief. It's all in my heart. And it's because of Israel. It's because of their rejection of their own true Savior. I grieve over them. I would like to change places with them if I could. It burdens me that, that deeply. And maybe, maybe the greatest problem is not just their national rejection, but if they miss out on Jesus, they missed out on the promises of God, and they missed out on the fact that God himself showed up. You can miss church next Sunday, and I don't think it would be a big deal. But if God showed up next Sunday and you wasn't here and somebody called you and told you, honey, Jesus showed up here Sunday. Woo, Lord, take me back in time. Just, just give me a time machine. I'm going to go back. I, whatever I was doing, it wasn't that important. They miss out. They miss out. What are you going to do? Because I believe, I'm certain about this, there are people right here in this audience, people online, people at home. You got somebody in your life who's rejecting Christ. You got somebody who says, oh, I believe, but it ain't that big a deal. It's not that important. But you know in your heart they don't know Jesus. Will you commit to pray for them earnestly? Will you take a risk? Take a risk. Share the gospel with them even if they decide, listen, I don't want to talk to you about this anymore. If they threaten you, listen, I don't want to be friends anymore if you keep bringing that Jesus stuff up. I'm not going to be inviting you to Sunday dinners if you keep bringing Jesus up. Take a risk. Tell them the gospel. Tell them about the story of God becoming a man. Coming for the purpose of going to Calvary, dying on the cross to pay their sin debt in full. Take a risk. Commit to pray for people. Commit to sharing the gospel with people. In fact, commit to sharing it with everybody you meet. Don't take that child standing in line there in front of you at the grocery store for granted. Oh, I'll drop a can on the floor in a minute. Somebody look around. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your help. You got two seconds. I'm going to tell you something. Before they know it, I'm going to share the gospel. You know you can share the gospel in 10 words, right? Somebody say, yeah. 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 10 words. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Yeah. It doesn't take, it don't take all day to share the gospel. You just need to know it. Then have the courage to share it. Have that conviction in you. Benjamin, when those friends of yours get together with you, and you're putting those moves on and playing ball, brother, don't just take them to the hoop. Take them straight to Calvary, brother. Take them straight to Calvary and tell them about Jesus while you put a move on them. Tell them. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. 
my help showed up a little while ago, and I think I could preach till 12 or 1, but I got to go. Got to let it go. God became a man. Yeah. Jesus Christ. He's the son of God. And he has a name above every other name. And he's worthy to be praised. God help us to unpack the scriptures. To know him better. To worship him. To praise him. To serve him. Here's the wisdom of the word of God today. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's faith in Christ alone that saves. Trust him to begin a work in your life that will not only get you to heaven, but transform you on this earth. Let's see what God wants to do in all of our lives. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. Help us to know you for who you are. Help us to recognize, Father, what you're doing. And that what you're doing in this world, in human history, is right. And our desire is to serve you and to line up with you and be a part of building your kingdom. I pray that for everyone under the sound of my voice today. Help us to join you, Lord. And we do it by faith. Now, Father, strengthen this church, encourage us all, help us, dear Lord, to be exactly what you want us to be here in Kima, help us to be in the business of making disciples, reaching the lost, living out love in a community of faith, help every man in this place, dear Father, to be a loving husband, a loving father, a provider, a protector, a spiritual leader. Help every woman in this place, Father, to be a priestess, to be a spiritual leader, to be a lover of husband, a lover of children, a lover of family. Help each one of us, young and old, who know you to use our spiritual gifts to edify others and glorify you. I pray your will in this church, and I thank you today for what you're doing. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.